You know how people are fond of a certain pen? Like, I happen to have a preference for the Pilot Precise V5s, while my husband always buys the Pilot G207. Well, when I asked him for gadget ideas for my collaboration with Home Gadget Geeks back in February, the first thing that popped into his mind was the topic for this episode. He's a bit of a gamer, and like we have our preferences for pens, apparently in the PC gaming world, they're enthusiasts who love finding just the right clickiness factor. In this episode, we'll look at the progression from typewriters to computers and how this common link between them has evolved over time. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind mechanical keyboards. But first, a quick message. If you like this podcast, you may be interested in other podcasts that focus on the humanities. In fact, if you search Twitter for the hashtag Humanities Podcast, you'll find plenty of shows on history, language, literature, philosophy, art, and more. These podcasts are by people who enjoy telling stories, exploring the arts in our world, and who want to share that knowledge. Some examples of podcasts you'll find are The Endless Knot, an in-depth podcast featuring history, etymology, and all-around fun facts about a different topic every episode. The Story Behind, a short narrative podcast featuring the extraordinary history of ordinary objects, people or places, or The Archaeology Podcast Network, which features a variety of podcasts focusing on archaeology. Search hashtag Humanities Podcast today or follow Humanities Podcasters on Twitter. And if you're a Humanities Podcaster, use the hashtag in your tweets so others can find you. In 1714, Englishman Harry Mill filed a patent for an artificial machine or method for the impressing or transcribing of letters, singly or progressively, one after another. Maybe he just had the idea for a typewriter, but not the invention. Or maybe he was working on it, but never quite got it right. Because the first working typewriter was created by Pellegrino Turri in 1808, in Italy for Countess Carolina Fantoni de Fivizzano, who was blind. She really was the first to perfect what many still struggle with, which is typing while not looking at the keyboard. In the 1870s, a typewriter known as a writing ball was introduced. Supposedly, Nietzsche received one for Christmas one year, and he hated it. If you ever look at an illustration of the writing ball, you could understand why. The keys were arranged in a dome pattern over a piece of paper. Only a few years later, Remington's Scholes and Glidden typewriter was introduced by newspaper man Christopher Scholes, and it was more like the old-fashioned typewriters you may be more familiar with, except that letters were typed onto paper underneath the carriage, meaning anyone typing at the time couldn't see what they were writing until it was complete, and they lifted the carriage to retrieve the paper. We won't get too in-depth about the typewriters themselves, But I wanted to get to this point because it was the Scholes and Glidden typewriter that was the first to introduce what's known as the QWERTY, or universal keyboard, we still use today. If you've ever wondered why keyboards are set up in the letter configuration they are, one of the theories, although it's never been proven, is because when Scholes was developing his typewriter, he studied combinations of letters to see which ones were commonly typed together and make sure they weren't too close to one another, since it might cause the keys to jam for those with quick fingers. A few other keyboard layouts have been introduced over the years, since we no longer really have to worry about typewriter keys jamming. But even though they may be more efficient for typing, the learning curve for everyone using the QWERTY keyboard would make it difficult to convince everyone to switch. Typewriter keyboards generally stayed the same through the turn of the century through the 1950s. When a key was pressed, a corresponding bar would come up and strike a ribbon against paper. IBM came out with its Selectric typewriter in 1961, which featured a type ball as opposed to individual type bars for every letter. The ball had all the letters on it, and when a key was pressed, the ball would turn and pivot to the correct letter. This cut down on keys jamming. IBM, by the way, had been making typewriters since the 1930s, even though we know them more for computer technology today. One more thing about type balls. They could easily be changed out of the Selectric typewriters, making it easier to change fonts. I couldn't find any evidence of any type balls offering Comic Sans, but if you want to find out more about that particular font, check out my episode, The Story Behind Comic Sans. 
In the early days of computers, not only did these machines take up an entire room, there wasn't the traditional keyboard we may think of today. A teletype was used to communicate information to the first computer, called the EINAC in 1948. Someone would use the teletype to punch holes in cards about the size of index cards, and the holes were code for different letters. The punch cards were then taken and inserted into a card reader, which would read the cards as data for the computer. The Binac computer, which came out the same year, used an electromagnetically controlled teletype to input data. And this was the model on which today's computer and keyboard connectivity is based. When computers started becoming available with screens that could display what was being typed, programmers made their own keyboards piece by piece. Personal computers made in the 1970s did come with their own keyboards, but these were more like switches on the front panel. IBM also sold converted electric typewriters to those who wanted separate keyboards. But since it was more programmers who bought the computers, and the idea of every home having its own computer was laughable at the time, many converted their own electric typewriters, or built their own second keyboard specifically for data entry. Just like anyone even remotely familiar with early cars would know the terms Model T and Model A, keyboard aficionados would be familiar with the terms Model M and Model F. These were keyboards introduced in the 1980s, starting with the Model M in 1984, introduced by IBM. If you remember back in the early days of home computers, the keyboards had a distinct click made by what's known as a bucking spring in each key, giving users tactile and audible feedback. A lighter, quieter, and more importantly, cheaper keyboard was introduced in the 90s using cheap rubber domes and membranes. But weirdly, people missed that clicky response after a while, and PC gamers became keyboard aficionados, and now gaming keyboards range in what I can only describe as clickiness factor. You may wonder why people would want louder, harder to press keys when keyboards such as those on laptops have been made to be lighter and much quieter. But the tactile feedback helps prevent typos. They're more efficient and have been shown to be easier to clean and longer lasting. Thanks to Jim Collison from TheAverageGuy.tv for having me on his show, Home Gadget Geeks, back in February to talk about mechanical keyboards and voice recognition, which we talked about in the previous episode. And as an aside, if you want to learn the story behind the mouse or other computer technology, I recommend the episode of the podcast Liar City called Great Artist Steal, the Xerox Park Story. And there will be a link in the show notes. Information for this episode was sourced from mechtype.com tomshardware.com, Mashable, and more links which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. Follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at storybehindpod, or subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks for listening.